welcome to a very special episode. This is week number three in our academic dissertation research study of examining my data analysis from Grand Canyon University. And just to preface this video off, if uh, you haven't watched the first two weeks, I encourage you to go ahead and start back there and uh, do so. But today, in the heart and spirit and essence of this entire playlist, I'm going to be interviewing participant number three in my data collection and so we'll be analyzing what participant three will be saying and I just want to back up here and just tell you about why this video playlist series was divided into 10 weeks I mentioned right off the top that it was because we have 10 different participants that were comprised of the final sample in my selection last week I explained that it was also a 10 part series because I'm dividing this into the 10 key strategic points like any dissertation has I told you as to summarize back to week number one that the broad topic we were looking at was examining uh, obesity and specifically looking at millennials in Atlanta, Georgia and dissecting this broad research problem. And uh, last week in uh, week number two I talked about the literature review which encompasses of course kind of the introduction background of the problem again obesity and being an epidemic and also breaking it down to the theoretical foundation as well as looking at the review of the literature which was in enormous, lots of information that was enriched in already contributed data that was very well written and empirical research that helped guide this study and this specific one. Now that we're in week number three, I'd like to tell you what the problem statement was of my dissertation. And that was that it was not known how self-determination was as a contributor to millennials reaching their personal training goals. Now, as you just heard, I said it was not known how. Any problem statement in a dissertation will start off with the words, it is not known, because that's what we're trying to determine. What is not known, and we're trying to determine what is already known and try to synthesize in that gap or that problem space, if you will. And I'm going to get to that in a little bit in the next week or two as we talk about problem space. But let me just focus on the problem statement for a second. I mentioned it is not known how self-determination is as a contributor to personal training goals for millennials. And that's really important. That's key for this study. That's why this study is a qualitative study, looking at it phenomenologically. We're looking at the hows and the whys, and it's more qualitative rather than quantitative. Uh, if this was a quantitative study, that dissertation problem statement would have started off with something like, it is not known if self-determination affects uh, millennials and their personal training goals as a contributor. Because the difference there, as you can tell, in a quantitative study, you're looking at just that, statistics, numbers. Uh, there was some quantitative data in this um, dissertation study, but mostly it was enriched with qualitative themes and codes, and I'll really get into that as we're nearing the end of the playlist. But be looking out for that. I encourage you, when you're listening to these interviews with these participants, you may notice some patterns that may be synthetically embedded in between some of the 10 participants uh, while we're going along. So please go ahead and take a look at that as I interview research participant number three today. As I mentioned, as always, there was inclusion criteria that refined this down to a fine sample, and that's why this next participant, he is going to be interviewed for the next 45 minutes, and he is a millennial living in Atlanta, Georgia, has worked out with a personal trainer towards goals in his personal training program. And so I'm excited to bring that to you here for the next 45 minutes plus of listening to research participant number three in the data collection of my dissertation, the self-determination of millennials and the realization of their personal training goals. So stay tuned. We'll be back. And before we do that, I'd like to invite everyone out there to please make sure that you like this video, leave us a comment or a question, and share it with all of your friends and family out there. That would be greatly appreciated. So without any further ado, here comes the interview with research participant number three. Okay, this is the interview for the self-determination of millennials in their realization of personal training goals. I have a participant on the line right now. Uh, first of all, I wanted to make sure that the participant can hear me. Yes, I can hear you. Perfect. And before we get going and I ask you the interview questions, I wanted to thank you very much for your time. I'm so excited that you're taking part in this study. Um, just wanted to let you know, um, we're very grateful that you uh, were recruited to us by Amazon Mechanical Turk and uh, your answers to the self-determination 
um, survey as well as the demographic questionnaire. Um, before I go further on that, I just wanna confirm that you were given an informed consent form and therefore you understood all of your rights to the form for the survey that you filled out for us, yes or no? Yes. Okay, great. And then also um, before we start the interview, uh, you were given a second in, uh, informed consent form acknowledging your rights and understanding that uh, you're in control of this interview. Anytime you want to stop, anytime you want to uh, not uh, volunteer and quit early, um, you can do that at any time. And um, you're not being forced to do this interview. And you agree with the informed consent uh, that you signed? Yes or no? Yes, I do. Okay, great. And then um, the purpose of this study, just to let you know, is that we're trying to examine how people like you of your age category, millennials, uh, describe self-determination as a contributor to realizing your current personal training goals. Uh, your information is going to be very valuable and it's going to help us uh, create a profile for people in your age demographic and uh, how as a uh, general uh, consensus of self-determination relating to your attainment of personal training goals. Um, how I just want to let you know how we're going to share these um, study results uh, with you as a participant. You're going to be provided a descriptive summary, including an individual self-determination profile. The length of the following interview is going to be about 40 to 60 minutes long. I'm going to ask you very open-ended questions, uh, meaning they're not going to be right or wrong. Uh, they're not going to necessarily be black or white. They're going to be your answers to how you feel about those uh, questions. So anything that you say, uh, well, should actually be true and right because they're uh, how you uh, actually feel about answering those questions. Um, confidentiality is going to be maintained at all times. I'll never use your name. Your name will never be published um, at all or any other private information. And all the information will be stored on an encrypted password protected computer only accessible to uh, myself, the researcher who will be conducting this interview with you. And at the end of this interview, I'm going to be uh, confirming all of our demographic uh, information together, just to make sure uh, when we finish that uh, all of that sounds accurate. Uh, one more thing before we jump into the interview. Um, at concluding the interview, I'm going to send you uh, the transcript for what we like to call member checking. So what that means is when we send you the transcript, you have the opportunity to read over it uh, just for clarity, just to make sure that uh, everything that you answer was uh, suiting to how you wanted to um, you know, say it in context. So for example, uh, when we give you the transcript of our audio file, and you look at it and say, you know, I didn't really mean it that way. I should edit that. That gives you an opportunity to modify and get that back to us. Um, so without any further ado, um, I'll ask you some concluding questions at the end. You'll have an opportunity to ask anything else about the interview. But do you have any uh, questions before we jump right into this interview? No, I don't. Okay, great. Okay, well, here goes nothing. So the first research question, just to let you know that you've already answered for us, the first research question that I have on my dissertation is how do millennials describe their self-determination in terms of autonomy, competence, and relatedness? We collected your answers through your uh, survey that you filled out for us. And that's what's gonna be guiding this interview um, for the following questions. So for research question number two, which we'll spend the next maybe 10, 15 minutes on talking about is autonomy. How do millennials describe autonomy as a contributor to realizing their personal training goals? To just give you a definition of autonomy uh, from self-determination theory, they define it as the desire to be causal agents of one's own life and act in harmony with one's integrated self. So what does that mean in layman's terms? Um, that basically means you're very independent. How autonomous are you in making decisions? Uh, if you had, for example, high autonomy, most likely you'd be very independent and make your own decisions out of your own free will. Uh, if you were a low autonomy, then that means you would not be good at making independent decisions. So for example, just pulling off a question off the survey you filled out with us. When it asked on the survey, I feel a sense of choice and freedom in the things I undertake. You gave it a score of five, which means that was completely true and strong agreement with yourself. Part of the reason we selected you as one of the final sample was because you scored so high on the self-determination scale, as well as your goal attainment um, composite uh, too, that led to you being one of our final 10 selected participants. So now that I've uh, kind of clarified autonomy here, 
Let me ask you the first research question for this interview. Can you describe whether you had some degree of autonomy or to what degree your autonomy was for your personal training program? In other words, was your autonomy like, uh, was there no autonomy at all involved in your personal training program? Was there a small amount, a moderate amount, a lot of autonomy involved? How much autonomy was there in your personal training program? And, and kind of go into that, please, for us. Well, well, I would say I was, I pretty much did whatever I wanted to do. I used my mm -hmm. train as a, um, as a guide to show me the exercises that I needed to do. Uh huh. And I put it into a notebook and listed them by day, the exercises that uh, the trainer wanted me to do. Mm. And then I kind of organized them to fit my schedule as far as which one, which exercises I did on which day. So I was totally, totally in charge of that. Um, you know, if, if one day I didn't have as much time, I could try to change up the schedule. And but I always kept a notebook and listed everything that I did. But but I, I was in charge of it. But the trainer definitely helped me get started. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That that's really interesting. So, you know, just kind of going on that uh, answer that you gave us, uh, was it your idea for the notebook, or did the trainer suggest that? You know, the trainer suggested that, and that was the best thing he or she could have done because um, it, I, I'm, I like lists and I like to check off what I've done and set my goals for the day. And with the notebook, I write it down. And if I don't write it down, that means I didn't do it. And I can go back to as, as a log and see what exercises I did in the last week, the last month. And, and it's, a, it's, I like it a lot. It keeps me on track. Mm -hmm. And let me ask you this, uh, kind of to further uh, talk about autonomy here, because on the survey that you gave to us and that had to do with self-determination for yourself, on the question of, I feel forced to do many things I wouldn't choose to do, you gave that a one, meaning that was not true at all in your case, meaning is it right to assume that just generally speaking, um, you would decide to um, choose things that you want to do rather than being forced to do them? Yeah, I, um, mm -hmm. I, I pretty much don't like to be forced to do anything. I like to be encouraged to do something mm -hmm. or told what the benefits of something would be. And then if I agree with it, of course, I'll do it. But I, I don't like the idea of being forced to do it. Mm -hmm. Can you please provide me an example of uh, anything that you personally wanted to do in your personal training program that your trainer agreed with you on that um, you came up with that idea and you thought, you know, we should do it this way. And the trainer went along with it and said, uh, yeah, great idea. Let's do that. Or, uh, you know, um, terrific idea. Why don't you go ahead and do that? Let me know how that goes. Was there an, uh, an example of that ever that that happened? Yeah, the uh, trainer was excellent with, uh, you know, free weights and uh, lifting weights and things like that. And for aerobics, uh, he, he was encouraging bicycling, walking and all that. But mm -hmm. I, I do have access to an indoor swimming pool. So I asked if I could do swimming laps. Mm -hmm. and uh, the trainer agreed and uh, mm. so um, i'm sure the trainer probably would have mentioned that if uh, he, the trainer had known i had a, access to a swimming pool but i thought that was a good addition to the aerobic part of the workout mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that's good and um let me ask you this uh, on the flip side of that question uh, would you, could you remember any time where you wanted to do, um, something to do with your personal training program and you really believed in it and, um, you just felt like it would definitely benefit, let's say you're, uh, reaching your personal training goals. Um, and, and you just really were so independent on that mindset, but it didn't necessarily, let's say align with your trainer, um, where you might not have uh, been in sync or been on the same, um, agreement did that ever happen and if so um can you go into detail about that please yeah i, I really can't think of anything that that i came up with you, you mean something that the trainer did not agree with it could be that or it could even be maybe the trainer agreed with it but thought well that's a good idea but it wouldn't be the way i would do it say is there any examples of that well i guess i could say this uh, with my schedule, I uh, work out 
I try to work out every day and mm. uh, some days I can do a full workout and other days I can only do a few exercises, but with my log, with my notebook, mm -hmm. I make a note of what I did and what I didn't do. Mm -hmm. So if in the morning I didn't complete everything in the afternoon, I'll see what I left off and I'll try to do a little bit more. And if I don't complete it the next day, I'll go back and finish that, that day. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, okay. And what, what about, let me ask you this then um, about your interests that have to do with personal training. You kind of touched on this, uh, for example, with the swimming, uh, but using other examples, let's say your interests uh, that have to do with fitness and getting in shape and exercising and achieving those goals. Um, would you say that they align uh, with your trainer's interests for you in terms of does your trainer uh, have the same mindset uh, interest wise of whatever you find interest in? Does your trainer uh, feel the same way? Oh, yes, I would definitely agree on that. Uh, when we first met, the trainer reviewed what I was looking for. And mm -hmm. uh, so we kind of decided then we set our goals and we agreed on the goals. Otherwise, I probably would not have used the training. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do, does it feel like, um, can you think of any times at all when your personal trainer might have given you a task or a list of items let's say in your program where it just felt like a chain of obligations or something that you were forced to do almost? No, I really don't. I mean, the trainer mm -hmm. had my best interest at heart. So what mm. was proposed was, um, was something I knew uh, was being proposed for my benefit. So I, I did not see that as a problem. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Would you say in terms of personal training then, uh, for the choices that you decide in your program uh, with your trainer, um, do they express who you are? Yeah, I think they do. Can you go into that a little further detail? Maybe just share us a story or give us some examples of, um, and, and just maybe paint us a picture of when someone looks at you and you're doing your personal training program, that expresses, that's a self-reflection of who you are. What does that look like for us if you were to paint that as a picture, let's say? Well, I, uh, I think it does in the fact that it shows that I, I, I set my goals, I work towards my goals. Uh, <coughs> I have a certain routine that I do and uh, not only with uh, my goals in physical fitness, but also in, in work. Uh, at work, I do the same thing. I set goals. I make a list. I check off my list each day of the things I want to do that day, similar to what I do when I'm doing my exercise with my list and I check them off. And if something's not done, then it, it stays on my desk until I do complete whatever it was I had decided to do. So, yeah, I think it's, um, it's definitely helped me not only physically, but uh, in my work life as well. Mm -hmm. That's good. Let me ask you this question. Um, with your trainer, let's say in the last year, were there any uh, outside limitations or outside forces that might have happened that would have conflicted with you being able to make any kind of autonomous decisions during your personal training program? So, for example, did things happen at all that were, let's say, out of your control or beyond your control that maybe caused any kind of setbacks or limitations uh, with you being able to uh, make any decisions out of autonomy in your personal training program? I guess you could say um, COVID affected our, our, our working relationship because mm. uh, the uh, fitness center was closed for a while and uh, mm. mm -hmm. so the weights, the free weights and the, the uh, machines that we used were not as readily available. So mm, the, tra mm -hmm. the trainer w was able to uh, work with me outside. And, um, you know, that was something different because we were used mm. to uh, a routine and then we had to come up with new routines with new exercises. Mm -hmm. we couldn't access the gym. Oh, okay. Okay. Very interesting. Okay. So, um, just touching on that a little bit further, uh, mentioning this COVID pandemic 
that happened uh, not only, of course, here in Atlanta, Georgia, but elsewhere throughout the country and throughout the world, in fact, um, closing down of gyms. And so mentioning having to uh, come up with alternative uh, solutions for your workout sessions, did it feel like uh, then um, with having to do that, were you still in control uh, after making those changes? So for example, you mentioned working outside. Did you still have a level of autonomy in deciding, okay, well, um, this is the route we're going to take and work out outside? How much percentage would you give autonomy for that then in terms of how important that was? Oh, I would still say uh, probably 90%. Because the trainer would work with me. I mean, I was doing exercises I didn't like, but mm -hmm. you know, considering the alternative, um, like he had this huge rope, like you'd pull a barge with, and he'd wrap it around a car tire, and I would, <laughs> put it and, you know, do it up and down. I hated that thing, but, <laughs> but I did because it was supposed to help me. But it's not something I normally would have done in our regular exercise routine. <laughs> Interesting. That's good. Okay. Um, but I'm going to uh, move on to competency here for a minute and um, still have autonomy in the back of your mind later when we uh, kind of tie this thing in when we're talking about self-determination, please. But let's talk about competence because that's the second or third component involved with uh, self-determination theory, which describes competence as, quote, seeking to control the outcome and experience mastery, meaning competence is that of somebody who can master a skill or improve their uh, skill set uh, at a certain task. In this case, what we're talking about, obviously, is uh, anything to do with personal training, whether it be your eating better or being more competent on working out better or being more competent about self-awareness about yourself that has to do with anything in terms of, I guess, health, fitness, and wellness uh, when it comes to personal training. On the competence survey, um, you did score very high on those as well. And uh, so, for example, um, I'll give you... Um, a uh, answer here that you had given us on one of them. Um, quote, I feel confident that I can do things well. You answered a four, which was agree, um, indicating that in general, as far as competence goes, uh, we're probably to assume that you do have a high level of uh, competence. Now, as we translate that into um, personal training goals, the third research question is how do millennials describe competence as a contributor to realizing their personal training goals? My first question to you is this, can you please describe whether you had some degree of competence or to what degree competence was during your personal training program, whether it was zero, small, moderate, large, was there any degree of competence in personal training on your behalf? And if so, how much? Oh, yeah, I think uh, I would say uh, a lot. Uh, mm -hmm. Just personal training and taking care of your physical body gave me actually confidence in myself, mm. uh, mm -hmm. not only physically, but in emotionally and, uh, and the way I looked at the day, I would feel better about myself because I was doing something to help myself. And then mm -hmm. I would go to work and I would feel better about myself. So I'd feel better about work. And I think it improved my, uh, my work performance as well. So I, I felt very competent. Yeah. Okay. Very good. And you mentioned the word confidence, but, uh, and, and that's good. Uh, also another word that's very close to confidence is capable. So um, kind of discerning um, confidence versus capable um, am I to assume then you were also highly capable in uh, feeling that you performed the exercise as well in your personal training program? Yes, I, I felt very capable. And uh, if there was something I didn't feel comfortable with, I would work at it until I was very good at it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And on the flip side of that, for example, in your survey on self-determination, you answered that uh, when it comes to, quote, I feel disappointed with many of my performances, you strongly disagreed with that in terms for yourself. Uh, when that comes to personal training and your trainer, let's say, for example, gave you a task to complete um, and you failed at it or did not do the task well, uh, what level of disappointment would you have then in that case um, 
for an example like that, feeling disappointed at any of your performances of your personal training program? No, I really never felt disappointed because I felt like the effort that I put into it made me feel like I was accomplishing something, even if I uh, wasn't as good at it as I thought I should be. At least mm-hmm. I, was, I was trying and I had the attitude that I could get better, I could do it better. I maybe couldn't do as many reps, but if I keep working at it, I can do more reps or that exercise really hurts or is uncomfortable. But if I do it and master mm-hmm. it, I'll get better at it. So, so it didn't seem to be, it didn't hinder me. Mm-hmm. Okay. And kind of touching on that a little bit <clears throat> in a further detail. Um, how about feeling secure about your abilities? Um, and I know that kind of goes close with confidence, but kind of uh, in terms of security and insecurity, or adequate and inadequacy. Can you just kind of go into that in terms of how that relates to personal training and what that looked like for achieving your goals, feeling whether you were secure about your abilities or insecure about your abilities for the most part? Well, I guess my physical appearance, if I went to, if I would go to a gym and my physical appearance uh, is not as great as some of these gym guys and gals that work out all the time. So I could mm-hmm. say I could feel intimidated by that. And if I cared, I would be intimidated, but I really didn't care. So I, I accepted myself the way I was, knowing I wanted to improve. So I didn't really feel, you know, I, I, I didn't lack confidence in that because, I, I, I you know, I'm, I'm doing it for me, not for somebody else. Mm, interesting. Okay. Let me ask you this hypothetical question. Uh, this is kind of a fun question in terms of competence. How competent would you be if you uh, the roles were reversed now at this point? Everything you've learned from your personal trainer, could you be competent to train another individual learning uh, just from being a novice or a beginner? Um, would you be pretty competent, fairly competent, greatly competent, not competent? Like, where would you give yourself in terms of if you're the personal trainer having to coach um, someone else in that uh, hypothetical situation? Yeah, I would feel fairly competent. Uh, <clears throat> I would I would understand the exercises and how they were performed. So I'd feel competent in that, but I wouldn't be as good as the trainer because the trainer is a professional and has a lot more knowledge than I do. And is uh, psychologically, the trainer knows how to deal with people better than I do because he and she, or she meets with so many different personalities in that same setting. In my work, it's a little different work and I don't uh, deal with personalities like that a trainer would do. So, hmm. uh, you know, I think I could do it, but of course I would not be as good as a trainer. Okay, good. And um, you mentioned a few minutes ago when we were talking about autonomy about um, having to uh, shift your workouts for the example of uh, outside and doing um, different alternative uh, exercises in your program. Did that ever affect competency in any way? For example, was competency um, playing any role when that situation uh, played itself out in terms of um, having to improve your competency level? Well, it was a challenge because the exercises were strange and new. Mm. So I did not feel as competent when I first started doing outside exercises. Mm-hmm. Plus, but- people passing by could see us. And that was a little intimidating because mm-hmm. people stare when you're outside doing exercises. And uh, so that that was a little different. But after doing the exercises, on a regular basis, then I felt competent to them. Yeah. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. How, in terms of competency, then can you tell us how successful, and you can give it a percentage if you want, um, or however best to answer this, how successful were you in achieving your personal training goals? Oh, I think I was 90% effective, I think. Mm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And you've talked a lot about the feeling secure and confident and um, believing in your abilities. If it was 90%, um, what was the other, let's look at the 
uh, on what maybe uh, still wasn't achieved or what was lacking. Um, what, what was it about that other part that um, we still needed in terms of competency level of helping you with personal training and helping you achieve your goals? Oh, I would say probably the aerobic exercises, the mm -hmm. getting outside, uh, running, swimming, biking. Although I did it, I didn't do it as as um, frequently as I did the indoor weights. And I still have a little bit of a uh, of a, a tummy that I wanted to lose more of. And I've lost some weight in the stomach area, but I still need to do more. But you know, brownies and chocolates and things like that always. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Okay. Um, we're going to move on now to the third component of the three in self-determination theory. But before we do, I please want you to kind of uh, hang on to that competence word in the back of your mind for later uh, when we talk a little bit about summarizing what we're discussing. Um, in terms of relatedness, that is defined from self-determination theory as the willing to act. Interact, I'm sorry. Uh, let me, pardon me, uh, restate that. Relatedness being the willing to interact with, be connected to, and to experience care for others. In other words, um, another word for relatedness could be belongingness, uh, the need and desire for belonging, or let's say interpersonal um, and social um, setting and social networking, for example, too. Uh, relatedness is uh, bringing us now to uh, research question number four being how do millennials describe relatedness as a contributor to realizing their personal training goals? So on the relatedness survey uh, questions and answers, uh, for example, on the uh, question of, um, uh, let's see, I experience a warm feeling with the people I spend time with. Uh, you gave that a score of five, meaning uh, that strongly agreed uh, and aligned with uh, how you felt about relatedness. But when we bring this into personal training now, uh, the first question I have of you for interviewing is, can you please describe whether you had some degree of relatedness or to what degree relatedness was in your personal training program, whether there was zero, uh, small amount, moderate, or large? I want to say a large amount. Um, um, the relationship I developed with the trainer encouraged me to work harder. Um, I enjoyed uh, the time I spent with the trainer. Uh, and I knew, I know the trainer had my best interest at heart. And so we, we kind of encouraged each other. And then with the improvement I had in my physical appearance and my health, I approached others with uh, a more positive attitude and uh, felt more connected to people. Would, you know, would feel better about talking to people and being around people. And so, yeah, it, it definitely helped me a lot. Being mm, okay, whole, good. And oh, I'm sorry. Uh, continue. No, I'm just saying the whole process of of finding a trainer that fits your schedule, doing the workouts recommended, developing a, a relationship. Uh, with someone who encouraged you, then you in turn in, just automatically would encourage others. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. No, that's, that's good. Okay. And um, on the flip side of that for a second, unrelatedness, um, <clears throat> for example, on the survey you filled out, um, quote, I feel that people who are important to me are cold and distant towards me. You gave that a score of one being not true at all. So in terms of personal training, uh, your trainer, is that, I'm going to assume, important to you that uh, that trainer is warm and uh, like you, using your words, you just said, relationship, connectedness, is that pretty important to you in terms of if that trainer wasn't that way, that that might affect your decision to want to continue with, uh, personal training with that trainer? Yeah, it would. It would affect me because... Uh, the relationship with the trainer uh, encouraged me to the point where I wanted to please the trainer. You know, I, I would always feel bad if I were I didn't do some exercises at home that I was supposed to do because I didn't want to disappoint the trainer. It was that close of a relationship. And if I'd had a trainer that didn't care, I wouldn't have gone that extra mile because I was doing it for myself. But underlying, I was also trying to 
to uh, please the trainer. Mm -hmm. I, I cared about my relationship with the trainer enough to want to do what they recommended. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's good. And uh, you've kind of answered this next question for me when I um, asked the question, how mutually connected did you feel with your personal trainer? Um, again, you've said several times, um, talked about that connection, but can you kind of describe the level of care that you and your personal trainer shared? Um, just kind of going into further detail, maybe illustrate to us, um, maybe from a session uh, or maybe even outside of personal training, um, if there, you mentioned the word for, uh, relationship, was there a friendship, you know, uh, anything in terms of level of care between you and your personal trainer that you shared? Can you go into that, please? Yeah, I mean, we uh, started out as, uh, as a trainer, but he ended up as, as a friend. Mm -hmm. And we uh, <clears throat> would uh, sometimes we go out to lunch after uh, a workout session and just uh -huh. talk. And I got to know the trainer better and uh, know about uh, his family and wife and children and the things mm -hmm. they, were, they were doing and going through. And he found out about my life and my family and we had a lot of mutual interests and um, we just developed a great friendship. And uh, here again, that encouraged me to want to please the trainer even more because uh, we, I didn't want to disappoint him. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. And um, with that hypothetical situation, again, let's say that the personal trainer had uh, moved on, was no longer around for any reason, transferred jobs, went to a different gym or what have you. Um, how important would your next personal trainer, those qualities be for uh, the next trainer to exude similar characteristics, friendship, um, things like that, that uh, your current trainer that he's currently doing with you? Yeah, I would look, look for the same thing because it uh, mm -hmm. was very successful. Uh, you know, it's hard to find somebody exactly like somebody mm -hmm. that you may really like but uh, i would look for that and if i didn't find that i'd still have the notebook that the trainer originally helped me to form with exercises and routines and even if the trainer were not around i would continue doing those exercises and still check hmm. off my list okay good good um then my next question to you is this um how important was time spent with your personal trainer to be close and a warm experience so in other words um, the time that you spent with him, uh, that you were together, uh, how important was that to you for it to be, uh, you know, a close and warm experience? That was very important because each time I would see the trainer, I would go, go back home and be more inspired to keep doing what I was doing <clears throat> to keep exercising and doing the workout routine on a daily basis. And if I'd not seen the trainer that frequently, it could have fallen by the wayside. Um, it, it was very, very encouraging. We, the trainer encouraged me, gave me inspiration, and it, yeah, it was great. I, I wouldn't, I would not have done it without a regular visit with my trainer. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And um, kind of touching on that as well, too. Um, on the flip side, let me ask you this question. Do you feel like, um, because on the survey question, I quote, feel the relationships I have are just superficial. You gave a one, not true at all. How would that question align with your personal training in your program? In other words, your relationship with your current personal trainer, I'm to assume uh, then it probably would not just be superficial from the answers you've provided me. Correct. Yeah. My relationship would be uh, one of friendship, uh, mm -hmm. a coaching relationship, a friendship relationship, encouraging relationship, um, nothing cold at all. I mean, his, the trainer had my best interests at heart and, um, and I knew that. And even if I was trying to uh, perform exercises that I didn't care to, to do or that were hard or I just didn't like, uh, I knew they were for my best interest. And, um, uh, so I would do them because I wanted to please the trainer and get those results that we both desired. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Do you feel like your personal trainer exudes the same type of relatedness qualities to all of his clients uh, in terms of, um, you know, working with all of uh, the different various clients that he's working with? 
would you say that he's equally um, invested and um, in, important to him in terms of how he treats each client individually? Yes, I would say that's true, one hundred percent. I, uh, the trainer, would even <clears throat> tell me about uh, other clients of his who maybe had a, a friend or a spouse or uh, or somebody pass away, and he would even go to the, a funeral for a trainer's uh, spouse or whatever, and uh, hmm. do things to help people who were down and out. And yeah, he, very very nice person whose traits were the type of person I would want to try to be. So yeah, that was very important. Hmm. Okay. Good. And um, the next question on relatedness. Then uh, again, speaking of relatedness, uh, looking at your program with your personal trainer, how successful were you in achieving your personal training goals when it comes to uh, relatedness as one of the factors? Yeah, I would think I would say I was very successful in tr achieving those goals. Uh, you know, you're never a hundred percent, but I'm working to working towards that. And uh, yeah, I would, the trainer helped me just to make up the mind that I want to do it and I'm going to do it, and nothing's going to stop me. So I'm very determined to continue. Good. Now, when we take into account um, what we just spoke about, uh, those three components, autonomy, competence, and relatedness, those are the factors um, that comprise self-determination according to the founders of self-determination theory. If you had to rank those three components from, let's say, one, two, and three, one was the most important, two was the second most important, three was the least important, is it possible for you to provide us a ranking then in terms of where they ranked of how they contributed to you realizing your personal training goals? All right. So tell me those three again. Mm -hmm. So we have autonomy, which once again is uh, how independent and autonomous you are making your own decisions. We had competence, which means how well you mastered a uh, certain skill set. In this case, uh, how well you improved in your personal training goals of, uh, you know, skills. And then third, we had relatedness, meaning the sense of belongingness and um, the connectedness and the relationships. So autonomy, competence, relatedness, is there a ranking for you or are they each equally, you know, distributed just as important or are you kind of indifferent to answering that in terms of um, there's not really a, a ranking? Like how, how would you answer that question? No, I, I could rank them. I okay. Think number one, first uh, for me would be related, <coughs> relatedness, <clears throat> because if I were mm -hmm. not feeling related, I would do nothing else. So mm. <coughs> relatedness is the most important to me. So that would be number one. Mm -hmm. Num number two, even though I could be autonomous, if I'm not competent, I'm not getting anywhere. So number two would be competent. Mm. Mm. And number three, would be, be autonomy so relatedness competence and autonomy mm -hmm. okay interesting okay good and now that um, moves me to the next part of uh, the kind of we're nearing the end of this the final set of uh, interview questions here now that we've got a profile for you because you've done a very excellent job on helping us build this personal profile for yourself of what we've just spoken about let me ask you this question. And, and again, this is maybe another fun question you can think about. And please take as long as you want to think about answering this. There's no rush. How does your generation, the millennials, anybody, uh, just to let you know, a millennial is defined as somebody who is today 24 years of age up to 39 years of age. How does your generation, the millennials, compare to other generations in terms of self-determination. So for example, how do you, your, your, you and your contemporaries around your age compare to either the younger generation, the folks who are you know uh, uh, younger than 24, or maybe even the folks who are kind of older, uh, baby boomers, for example. It, what's the comparison there? Is there a comparison when you think about that in terms of self-determination? That's a tough question <clears throat> because I can only speak for myself. <clears throat> and I don't know about the other other generations, but if I had to say something from what I've seen, I would say probably the, the folks that are younger than us uh, are, don't seem to be as committed long term. They'll have a short term commitment and then they 
get off onto some other tangent. Uh, in the older generation, um, I don't see, I, I may be wrong, but I don't see them with trainers working out. You know, I, I was going to say, I don't see the older generation with trainers as much, but on second thought, when I'm in the, in the uh, fitness center, there are a lot of older generation people with trainers. So mm -hmm. I, I would say, <laughs> I would say the youngest generation is lazier and then my generation and the older generation are more committed, but that's mm -hmm. general. I really don't know. I'm just guessing. No, that's fine. That That's okay. Yeah. And you know, answering that in uh, of a total self-determination uh, answer, how about, the, and this is probably even harder than to answer, uh, but if you want to take a stab at it, um, is there a difference, would you say, of autonomy, competence, relatedness among the generations? I would say there probably is. Um, I, I would say maybe the younger generation puts more emphasis on autonomy mm -hmm. and maybe the older generation, maybe more on relatedness. Uh, mm -hmm. Cause I see people in the fitness center and the older people seem to be more connected to their trainer. Uh, it could be they they're lonely and they're looking for friendship and they don't really want to do the exercises They're they're just there for the friendship. I don't really know, but they do the exercises. So I would say relatedness, for the older generation is more important autonomy for the younger generation i think mm -hmm, mm -hmm. okay good um excellent now i want to uh before we end the interview just ask you a few more questions please um one of them is our demographic information i need you to please confirm your demographic demographic data that you previously provided and i'm going to just go ahead and read over these and just uh let us know that these are accurate um, your current age, you are a 39 year old male. Yes. Uh, and you are white Caucasian. Yes. And you have been working out with your personal trainer for more than three years. Yes. And on average, you've been working out with your personal trainer for three or more times per week. Yes. Okay. At the beginning of your program, it looks like you were 20% body fat um, and then most recently, 15% body fat. So in your program, you've lost 5% body fat? Yes. Okay. And then finally, uh, just to confirm, you were at the beginning of your uh, personal training program, 180 pounds, finishing at 170 pounds with a net loss of 10 pounds? Yes. Okay, perfect. Um, that's great. Now I'd like to turn the um, opportunity around for you, please. Are there any other um, comments that you'd like to add on to or clarify or make to any of the interview questions that we just went over about your personal training program? Um, I, would, I would just say that uh, developing a one-on-one -on -one relationship with a trainer really helps me and I think would help anyone to uh, get inspired to improve themselves and um, feel better about themselves. So I think that's, I, I think that's great. I, I, I would encourage anyone to get a trainer and develop a relationship and follow through and, and see what the results will, will be. Great. And um, lastly, are there any other questions that you might have of uh, in terms of this interview that we just conducted regarding the personal training program? Um, so I assume this will be a, a paper eventually. Yes, I'm glad you asked that. Um, before I stop our recording here momentarily, let me answer that question for you. This is exciting because uh, it will be part of a research study that's going to be hopefully published very soon within the next two months from when we're recording this. And um, as soon as it's published, what you'll be able to see, it's going to be the first study of its kind. It's very unique because you'll get to see, we like to call it a qualitative descriptive design, and you're going to be able to see how you match up uh, in your profile with other millennials. So in other words, other millennials 
who are your age, who live in Atlanta, Georgia, like yourself, been working out with a personal training or trainer for goals, you're going to see how um, that aligns and, and the comparisons and the contrasts. And it's going to be published as part of a, a dissertation that uh, I myself, the researcher, is trying to complete. And so uh, with uh, the data analysis portion, I'm going to be looking through your answers in your interview and kind of finding themes um, and kind of doing what we call thematic analysis of uh, all the interviews together. So uh, I'm glad you asked that because I will definitely get you uh, information about your answers and the other millennials answers too, um, because it's very important. You know, um, this is going to be so helpful, I believe, for future studies to be able to uh, look at of how this um, study uh, was done and looked at the phenomenon of answering these research questions, which you've been a, a, a tremendous great part of. So I want to thank you so much again for your time and efforts for helping us out. Oh, you're welcome. Glad, glad to help you. Excellent. Well, um, if you don't have any other questions, um, please stay on as soon as I uh, hit the record button, because I do want to talk to you about uh, payment and compensating you for your time for our interview together that we just did, and also for following up. So that way I can email you the information that I just told you uh, that I was going to promise to get to you. Okay. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Thank you. And I'm going to hit the stop button right now.